My name is Noor Abu Sharia. Um, I'm 22 years old. I was actually born in Gaza, so that means I am from Gaza, but I've lived here ever since I was a kid. There was a very um, anticipated humanitarian ceasefire or humanitarian pause in the war. It was supposed to be on a Thursday, but however, it was pushed to a Friday. And unfortunately, that one day delay, that one day postponement caused a literal catastrophe in our family. It's one of the biggest and tragic losses in the, for the Abu Sharia family. Um, 150 lives were martyred in Al Sabra district in Gaza, which is northern Gaza. Um, for context, my family, the Abu Sharia family in general, I mean, we've built generations upon generations and homes and businesses in Al Sabra district, but our homes are primarily in one street. And so my uncles and my aunts were on one end, and you kind of just start from the northern end to the southern end. I'm not sure where exactly. I haven't been there since 2015. So I forget if it was the northern end or the southern end. Um, but basically, one end of the streets were attacked by Israeli bombs. And my aunts, two of my aunts, my elder aunt and my youngest aunt, had husbands and a son on the other end of the street, and um, my youngest uncle's family had also been visiting their family across literally the same street um, with her five kids. And so once they heard a bombing at the other end, they were just fearful and concerned, and obviously they ran to go help. They Once they arrived, they found my eldest aunt's husband, he was already martyred. Um, they managed to get one of my cousins, my eldest cousin, Ahmed, and my youngest aunt's husband, uh, Amu Sliman, but his leg was cut off and so he was already bleeding and at risk of, at risk of dying right there on the spot. My uncles, my aunts, my two cousins had managed to get my cousin Ahmed, and somehow they managed to carry injured Amu Suleiman across the street where they met with, where they met with, they met with my uncle's wife and five children. The rest of the block was um, bombed. Uh, I was told it was three airstrikes. Some, um, somehow my uncle, and his five kids and his wife made it out alive, but they were split into two. But that means my two cousins, Karim and Amr, along with Amtu Banan, and my Amtu Jihan, along with her older son, Ahmed, were all martyred within the second airstrike. Um, to make matters even more complicated, my youngest uncle, again, had gotten split from his family. Um, Khaltu Arwa, his wife, had carried three of her kids and ran in the midst of the first airstrike and forgotten her two youngest children, her youngest son and youngest daughter. One who suffered a concussion, I'm not sure what her circumstances are given that there's no functioning hospitals in Gaza. But um, in the midst of the second airstrike, he went back took his kids because he heard them screaming and crying and they were alone. I mean, I can't imagine what their mother was going through if she had forgotten her kids. I mean, the fear and, and the paralysis that she was probably feeling. Uh, to keep everyone safe, she decided to flee with her three kids to the only functioning hospital, which is the Mamadani Hospital in northern Gaza. Um, the reason she did this was because she was scared that if Israeli snipers or if Israeli drones managed to see her going towards the building that my uncles and the rest of my uncles and aunts were staying at, her husband included, they would bomb the fifth building, I, would, I believe it would be, on the, on the, in the street. And so she made that split decision to just flee to the hospital. And it's, it's, 
I mean, to us, it may seem like a far walk, but I mean, Gaza is a pretty small area, so um, it's it, it was very difficult for her to just kind of pick up and, and, and pick up her kids and forget the rest and just leave. And in, in order to keep the rest of the family safe, she made that split decision to be as selfless as possible. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Since October 7th and since the Israeli bombardment on Gaza, I felt so paralyzed and so helpless. Um, I wish there was something more that I could do. I know we, we have a lot of protests, there's a lot of actions that we can take here and, and, and hold our politicians accountable and our representatives accountable, but the thing is, it's like, will it ever be enough? And that's, that's been a question that I've been asking myself a lot, where it's like, they're still dying and we're still not getting what we want. The people of Gaza, unfortunately, aren't being treated as humans. And they deserve more than ever an ounce of humanity. And it's just a feeling of paralysis. That's, that's what I feel. I feel paralyzed. I see a lot of hope and a lot of resilience in them, despite the fact that they are going through one of the worst massacres and the worst genocides that Palestine as a whole has ever seen. They seem very hopeful. They'll still try to crack a smile or, or make a joke on, I mean, I have a group chat with my family and they, they'll still try to make a joke. They'll still try to put a smile on our faces. And if anything, they give us more strength than we give them. They, they have some of the strongest faith I've ever seen. They have such faith and such trust in Allah. And it's just, it's, it's unbelievable and it's fascinating how strong, how much stronger they are than, than we are. Um, we, they always tell us we find our strength in you, but honestly, it's the other way around. We find strength in them. I was talking to my 17-year-old cousin, um, Hala, and she unfortunately had to flee her house along with her brothers and her mom. They left within the first two weeks of the massacre, and she would still have hope that she was going to go back to her home, that she was going to go back to school. She was, in, she was starting her senior year of, of high school. So she had such high ambitions. And I told her, you know what, you're going to come and study college here. I'm going to bring you here. I'm going to do my best. And she's, she still holds on to this hope, even though their house, she, was, she sent me a video today. Her house was broken into by the IDF, yet she still holds hope that she's going to go back and they're going to rebuild Gaza. And I just, I admire that hope so much. Admiration is the least, it's like the word doesn't even describe the amount of emotions I have towards it. I don't think I've ever seen a shift in the narrative when it comes to Gaza and Palestine as a whole. Um, the truth is beginning, is, is starting to become more difficult to hide. And so the fact that we have such powerful voices and journalists in Gaza showing the truth and, and speaking the truth, I think, plays such a vital role in the shift in the narrative. A bit of a shift in the American news outlets as, as well. Um, people are starting to seek education and educate themselves on the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian occupation. And so it's, 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 it makes me very optimistic and very hopeful that people, young and old, are starting to really put themselves out there and learn. And they're willing to learn to hopefully save whatever ounce of humanity this world has. It's been hard to be hopeful in these, in this pa in the pa these past 52, 53 days, um, given what we're seeing. But again, the shift in narrative kind of keeps you going, as well as the fact that your my family in Gaza was hopeful. Even the ones that I lost, they were so full of life. They had ambitions. They had so many hopes and dreams that they wanted to fulfill, and unfortunately, they weren't able to. Um, yet they kept going, knowing the truth and knowing that they might not live to see the next day. 
And so I am thankful that I get to be the voice for my, not only my family, but for the Ghazan people. And I'm thankful to be given a platform to speak on behalf of my family and to tell their story and to hopefully fulfill some of their hopes and some of their dreams for them.